just an assessment as I have seen from outside, you know, you develop into a player that you are today. Uh, you know, when you guys came to our course, to, to all you guys, like you, know, you were the top guys in Tamil Nadu, even you uh, Balaji and you were hitting, you know, Vijay, Vijay uh, Sundar Prashant. Mm-hmm. I could see that you you had a big game. You were, you were nailing those four runs. This was, I'm talking about like uh, several years ago, seven years or more. And, uh, but then I also know, I've seen a couple of matches that you played, you were pretty conservative. You were trying to be safe and, uh, you know, yeah. And then at one point, I think you decided to take more risk, be more aggressive. And and you kept losing matches, precisely what you said some time before. Mm-hmm. So what made you believe that this is the one, even though you were losing for a while, that this is the one to take you forward? I think... Uh that particular example, uh, which usually happens to a lot of players where, you know, they're more aggressive in practice and they end up being defensive in the matches uh, or defensive when it, start, when it counts. And uh, for me, uh, you know, at the end of it, no matter what skills we develop or what we do in practice, at the end of the day, when we go on court to play a match, what we really want to do is win. So, that was overriding every other, um, uh, every other factor in my head and in my instincts. So I always played the point to somehow find a way to win it and that worked for, up to a point and then eventually I was starting to hit a ceiling where I couldn't win matches or I was running out of gas every time because of what I was doing. I was having this, let me win this point and the next point and then I'll see what to do later and I wasn't able to succeed any further. So then I realized, okay, I have to start to use what I already know how to do and it was a little interesting for me you because remember, I, you remember. Do you remember at what age this was? That you hit the ceiling uh, and then you when I, well, I think when I made the transition between futures to challengers, that's where I started to have this problem because I was able to get through the futures players at the time by making a lot of balls and playing high balls in the backhand, for example, staying tough in the big moments. But then once I got to the next level, that was not enough. I was not getting enough of those situations where I had the break points or where I was able to just tough out the other guy. They would just beat me with skill, for example. So then I realized, okay, I have to start using what weapons I have, which I believed was being able to play fast, for example. And uh, so then initially when I started to do that, I obviously lost a lot of matches, like you said. But the one thing that kept me, uh, made me believe in that uh, in that uh, aspect was the fact that I had done it well in practice. So I kept telling myself, you already have it. It's not a skill set that you're trying to develop overnight. You've been yeah. doing this for many years, you just never used it in the match. So. Yeah. Believe that you do it in the match enough times, it will start to fall into place, and then I'm glad that it did. Okay, then, uh, uh, but it's not that easy to say. To say it is one thing to uh, actually believe and then go after it and continue doing that. Especially after you had some success, you are a pretty good player in the country, and then you are also ranking is not bad. The thing is, you need to make the next jump, but. How do you? How did you make yourself believe over that period of time? Did somebody help you, or is it something that you kept telling yourself? Uh, I, I mean, I had my. I, I always had people who I used to go to for advice. You know, coaches from the Balusa, for example, my coaches in Germany, and uh, my dad was also somebody who I always went to uh, when I came to this. And I used to ask them, and you know, everybody had a little bit of a different opinion, but at the end of it. Uh, it was pretty simple. Everyone said, if you if you feel that this is the right move to go up, then you you can do it, even if you are going to go down for some time. And like you said, it's it's easier said than done because at the end of it, when you're in the middle of all that and you're losing all the time, you can't see clearly. So I sometimes I used to write things down and say, okay, I'm going to write it down now and then say for this many months, I'm not going to question this path. I'm going to stick to it and then when I finish this many months of stick, sticking with it, then I'll come back and reevaluate. Because otherwise, every every week you start to you know flip back and forth. Then you are neither here nor there. Right. So it was like a long term commitment, yeah. looking at the long term uh, you know prospects and the improvement rather than looking at the short term benefits yeah. and you know yeah. uh, the losses. Perfect. Uh, so you mentioned about uh, playing to the opponent's high you know the high backhand, which is normally yeah. weak for a lot of players. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, but as you go higher up. Yeah, as you, uh, you know, futures level, yes, but then when you go higher up, the it is not that obvious, you mm-hmm. know, the weaknesses. Uh, yeah. Do you still look for weaknesses in the opponent when you play the challenger level or you're going there to just enforce your game? 
Uh, no, I think uh, it's a combination of both of those factors. And once again, that depends on the player. Um, and the less explosive or the less uh, you can impose the game on the opponent, the more tactical you need to be. So if you're not going to be able to serve 220 kilometers an hour every time, then you have to know which uh, side the, uh, so the returner likes more. Uh, which side is he more solid under pressure? Which side can he hit a bigger shot? So all of those factors become much more important if you can't say, you know, I'm just going to hit the first serve and then the next ball that comes, I'm going to blast it and he can't do anything. Then it really doesn't, it matters less uh, what the opponent does. But for most players, I think uh, being aware of what, what the strengths and weaknesses of the opponent, opponent is is very important at every level. And like you said, obviously the margins are less as you go up. But there is always room, there's always a gap and uh, you just, you know, the closer you get to that level, the more you see it. Uh, initially, maybe from outside you feel, oh, he can hit four hands, back hands, everything looks clean. Then, you know, then you have to see, can he do it for two hours? Or you see, can he do it at four all thirty all? Is he brave enough to play the same shot then? So, or is he reckless? Does he have bad shot selection? So, there is always a reason why a player is ranked at a particular level consistently unless he's going up. And usually, you you will see the reasons why when you you know when you compete and when you look for those things. Okay, so uh, uh, talking about you know uh, tactics in matches and uh, you know uh, I know your your performance depends on a particular day on how well you're able to execute your strokes and how well you're able to repeat that over and over again throughout the match, like you know serving or forehand. Uh, but also depends on your tactics, like you said. Yeah, it depends on what if you're using the right tactics or not. So, uh, can you give us some uh, insight about how you prepare for particular opponents in terms of tactics? Yeah, I try to uh, I try to watch as many videos as possible on my opponents, and then I ask the players. I, I obviously look up the matches they played and see if they played somebody I know. Then I talk to those friends of mine and say, okay, what do these what do these guys do well? What do they not do well? Some of it will obviously repeat, but then you may find uh, one or two things from uh, some players where you say, oh, okay, you picked up something that maybe nobody else saw. Yes, and I've noticed that this especially, especially happens with the guys like I mentioned. The bigger the game, the less info you get, the uh, or and the less let's say less power that's involved in someone's tennis, the more tactical they are. So when I get when I see, for example, that G1 has played an opponent, or for example, Somdev, you know, these guys who always are able to use their tactics to, to their advantage, then I get a lot more information. Uh, um, and it's, it, and that's normal, you know, it's, it's just like everything. When your forehand is very strong, maybe your backhand is not as good. But if your forehand is average, automatically you, you're forced to have a better backhand because you don't have a choice. And in that sense, uh, you know, the players who cannot hit the ball, who cannot sort of hit the skin off the ball are always going to be uh, smart on the court. And um, so, yeah, I try to analyze the players by asking players and watching videos and then trying to watch matches. If they're in the same tournament, usually I'll know if I beat the guy in the first round, I'm going to play one of two opponents in the second round. So, if I have the chance to watch the match, then I go and sit watch that match just before mine. Um, or if my coach is there, then I say, okay, can you watch that match and let me know what do you think, what do you see? Uh, and obviously all of that is, uh, you know, it, they may play different on that day and different against me, but some of the basic stuff will be the same. And then the rest of it, I try to figure out as fast as possible, in, uh, as early as possible in the match when I start. Okay, that's very good. Uh, the thing is that that brings to uh, the light that when you talk to the other players like the Jeevan or uh, Somdev or Vijay or you know Balaji, anyone, all of them are forthcoming in giving you the information that you will need for the match, which is which is a phenomenal thing. As in, all of you guys never look at each other as competition. You're looking at the entire you know the the right. whole thing out out there as competition. Uh, same thing with you when you come and uh, play with say Manish or Piti for example. You, you are so willing to come and help them out in what they are doing. And, and coming from you, it definitely carries that weight. So it is something that, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the general feeling for people is when you guys, like SP was talking about it, when you reach a certain height, you don't want the others to come up. Right. 
this used to be you know a gentle talk with people but then i want to prove that it's not true all you guys are so willing to help the other guys to come up yeah i okay. i uh, be- okay. believe that so, yeah 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 please go ahead so no, go ahead it's yours yeah i i believe that uh, you know the the more i help the players around me first thing is i also learn because the more uh, some it's like it's like you know how they say the best way to learn is to be a teacher so when you start trying to explain something to someone if you don't know it through and through you will have doubts and you won't be able to explain it properly that's one part and another thing is i want to be able to help the players who are coming up because i feel some of the things i learned the hard way and you know i maybe didn't have someone to tell me and the sort of uh help me do it in one day or two days i had to learn over a period of a year or six months or lose 10 matches to learn that uh, thing and i would like to help the players who are working hard around me who i feel you know they are trying to succeed and why if i'm in a position to help them get that uh, skill set faster or learn something earlier because of me i'm very happy to do it and if they come to a position where they are starting to beat me then at that point I will say okay then this guy is stuck or he's finding a way to overcome whatever I have and I'll compete with him and find a way to go up cuz I come I, I will find a way to be the fighter in that moment and not say oh my god I should not help him I should just keep him below by uh, you know telling him the wrong things I would rather than be, it be healthy competition and we both yeah. succeed yeah. the the goal is you need to grow it is not to keep somebody else down that you know you feel that you're superior correct it's, it's so true Uh, yeah. yeah. You want to say something? No, no, I, I agree with you. Okay. Uh, you were talking about your friends helping you out with these tactics, right? So, can you give us some examples, some you know, actual facts about what they tell you about certain opponents, their styles, and what will work based on what your strengths are, things like that? Yeah. Uh, I, the first example I can think of when it comes to this is G1 because he's uh, he's quite good tactically. He's the he's the master. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So whenever I ask him, you know, he, um, he, obviously the general stuff, he'll be like, "This guy's forehand better. This guy's backhand is better. Whichever one." And he tells me about the serve. But then a couple of the things which are pretty special when it comes to what he notices is he remembers what the guy likes to serve at thirty all or what he likes to serve on break point, and those are huge because then. you know in that moment you're saying okay 70 30 there's a chance he's going to serve this direction at 30 40 and you only need one break per set to you know convert especially for someone like me who who in general tries to serve as well as possible and hold on to every service game if i get to 130 40 40 and i pick the right side because jeevan helped me saying in general i've seen that this is what he likes that's good enough if i react a split second faster and i make the return that's a big advantage uh so that's something pretty uh, special i think he's able to see those little things and or maybe every a lot of people see but he remembers them he notes it down and you know i don't know if he writes it but at least he makes a mental note and he's able to recall that when he needs it so that's uh, something quite special i'm sure somdev is also one of those guys who has that i just haven't spoken yeah. to him as much because the circuit i play he knows less of the players or i the sub cycle where jeevan yeah. was more yeah. uh, sort of you know playing mm-hmm. alongside me Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cool. Uh, now uh, preparing for the match with a certain tactic is one thing, mm-hmm. and, and then you go into the match, and then you have to see if the tactic that you prepared and went in with is working or not. Uh, that yeah. is one thing. The second scenario is where you might have played a player once, and it's you know getting information from others is one thing, but you playing and experiencing it is another thing. So you might have lost to a player. and then the next time you played him you had more knowledge and then you went back and beat him because you changed your tactics yeah. the execution right. levels might have been the same but you just changed tactics which helped you beat him uh, at the same time another scenario is where you are starting to play with a certain tactic and then you notice that it is not working and then you are down in the match and then you change your tactics you could come back and beat him you know you just find a way to win Uh, 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 it could be a pattern of play. It could be a certain tactic, whatever. So, can you recall yeah. three instances where you can give us the details about what exactly happened, what tactic you changed, etc. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, for example, uh, when I played Balaji for the longest time, uh, I used to try to attack his backhand with my forehand because my forehand is my strength, and I always went, like I said, cross court, high ball to the backhand, and I tried to hurt the opponent. 
and which is what I tried to do against Balaji. But the problem oh, is that his backhand is very good. Yeah. Yes. So he was, and one of the things he likes to do is he likes to take the ball a little early. So the higher I tried to hit it, the earlier he came in and took it and pressed the ball down, and I was losing the um, the edge that I had in the rally, and. Uh, I was obviously very reluctant to say, okay, I'm going to go down the line and then go the other way because I wasn't in co- as confident in my back end. But then I had to try it because I was losing points and I said, let me try going the other way, see what happens. And in the middle of the match, when I made that tactical change and I realized even though I was uncomfortable, I was winning more points on this side than I was winning on the forehand. So then I said, okay, for whatever reason, I'm winning the points here more than I am on my strength. So I'm just going to stick to it and uh, you know find a way through that match. And then... When I did that, I won the match first of all by using a tactic I'm not used to. So that helped me because then I realized that I can rely on that more the next time around. It gives me confidence on something which I'm usually not relying on. And it showed me that I can make a tactical adjustment in the during the match, which usually, you know, you like you said, you come up with a plan and you try to stick to it. But there I realized I had to think on my feet. And uh, this is one of those examples when I played Balaji. That was one of them where I switched from trying to attack his backhand to attacking his forehand. Uh, then uh, one of the things which uh, for me worked very well was uh, I always used to serve, uh, I used to try to serve sort of big and go for aces and uh, try to sort of win the point outright with the serve on with speed and uh, and then I ended up facing uh, these Japanese players and one of them was Moriya, Hiroki Moriya and uh, he's someone who's very good in Ready to hit a big first serve, the ball came back with interest. And I was initially when I when it was happening, I said, Okay, then I have to serve bigger. I have to, you know, even go for more and then find a way through him. And then after a set, I, I, I figured it out earlier, but I guess I was sort of being stubborn and trying to still do more in the same uh, same department and try to find a way through him. And eventually I realized it's not possible. And then I said, Okay, I'm gonna have to mix with more slice serves, take out the speed. Don't give him the center of the racket every time. Let him move a little bit before he has to hit the same return. Even if it's not going to be an ace, at least he cannot. He doesn't smack it. And, and then I started mixing that with body serves and with kick serves. And uh, once I did that, then the rhythm changed for him. He broke. He was not able to time the ball as well. And then when I used the big first serves, it helped because then it was you know change in pace, change in rhythm, and all of a sudden he was uncomfortable. And that feeling of being uncomfortable doesn't just end with one shot. It doesn't end with just the return. It, le- it creeps into the rest of your game. So, for example, it started creeping into his next shot after the return or his service games. And then that amount of doubt is enough was enough for me yeah. to find a way they are back into the match. And uh, that showed me on that day that, you know, sometimes just because you have a strength doesn't mean by blindly going to that you're going to win the match. So, that is another example. And something that I'm not very used to doing which and... Uh, it made me happy in that moment to know that I could find a way to win without using power. Uh, and the more instances that happened like this, the more I started to realize that I don't have to be a player who relies just on one or two things. And that I yeah. could do, first of all, that I had more things in my game. And second of all, that if I didn't, I could learn it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's when you started to mature like as a, as a player that you are today. Yeah, yeah. correct. <laughs> um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is that uh, your best performance or your, your you, you won your first Futures title when you were 24? Yeah, 23, 24, yes, something yes. Yeah. And uh, till then, your performance was not up to that thing. Like, uh, <laughs> isn't that true? Yeah, uh, I, I think I, I was always able to play. Um, I mean, I believe that played well. Uh, but I was never able to make those breakthroughs. I had some, I had a lot of injuries, for example. I was not yeah. able to consistently compete in the circuit. And then when I did, it was only for a few months. And when I, and few months, I was not good enough to win matches at the future's level. So I was always trying to knock on that door, but I, I had obstacles in my path. And eventually, when I was able to sort of play for long enough, then I made that breakthrough in the future circuit and won my first title. I won that in, I think my first one was in Chennai, in the Nongabagam yeah, yeah, Stadium. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. My home okay. ground. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, talking about that, uh, a lot of your performances has come in the Indian soil. 
in mm-hmm. tournaments, in futures, uh, in challenges as well. I think out of the two challenges, to one and uh, the two reached finals. One victory and one finals was in India. The same thing, I think, in futures also. I think you won uh, more than 50% of your uh, titles or finals in okay. India. Yeah. Now, yeah, the reason why I'm talk- bringing that up is to uh, highlight the importance of what, you know, well, first I want you to tell me what is the advantage you feel when you play the competition in India? Okay. Uh, so I think uh, there's two sides to that. Uh, one is obviously being a, the more tournaments there are in India, the better it is. That is very simple. There's no, there's no argument about that. More tournaments at every level. It's not about whether it's a futures or a challenger or a, you know, a, a non-ranking tournament. Every single tournament that is there or more tournaments that can be hosted is better for the tennis players in India because they learn to compete against each other. They uh, test their skills, whatever they've been developing and learn to compete better, become better overall tennis players. And uh, second thing is it is financially less of a burden to be able to play in your home country uh, you know, it's closer to home. You, you, and the financial constraints in tennis are huge. It's an expensive sport to start with, and if you're going to have to travel 30, 35 weeks uh, to play tournaments outside India, it's very difficult. So, if we can manage to organize those tournaments at home, there's nothing like it. Uh, countries like China, uh, you know, bad country to use in this moment as an example for anything because of the virus and everybody. You know, I know that people are upset with uh, where they feel it originated. But the fact is, in this department, they've done the right thing. They've had a lot of tournaments, and players, including me, have benefited by being able to play in China. And all Japan, for example, they have a lot of tournaments also. So when we have tournaments closer to home, at least for me, Asia is closer than going to uh, North America, for example, for every uh, for tournaments. I get to come back home, I get to play in here, I can sort of live a little bit more of a normal life. Uh, you, know, you know, and being a tennis player is hard. You have to play for many, many months and many years on the road and, uh, you know, you can't um, underestimate the, fa- the uh, you know, uh, getting burnt out early if you have to suffer a lot along the way. And uh, I think having tournaments in India helps a lot. Uh, first of all, you also show your peers in India that if you're, for example, if one player is far better than the others, uh, that guy starts winning those matches and then everybody else feels, I have to catch this guy somehow. I have to catch that player, what are they doing better than me? And then they try to find a way. And like I said, that healthy competition grows, lets everybody uh, raise their level. And I think I remember hearing this on TV or watching an interview where even Federer said when uh, Hewitt won his first Grand Slam or became world number one, he said even I believe then I could do it if Hewitt is doing it. So if somebody like Federer who is a legend in the game and considered an all-time great or the greatest, had to wait for Hewitt to succeed and uh, at the, succeed to the extent that he believed was great before he believed he could do it is something that shows you that uh, you know belief is not something that happens automatically. So when there are people that you see in front of you who are succeeding who are better than you, then you you, can, you start to go in that direction. So it's very yeah. important. And the more tournaments we have here, the more international players are going to come. They're going to compete. Better players are going to come to India because there are regularly more tournaments. And then automatically the level will go up. Okay, yeah. So that's that's a very important point, uh, for uh, if you, people keep asking me about, uh, you know, helping Indian players and why are too many players are coming up as in Europe or you know, we we are little what do you say we started off a bit late, but two three mm-hmm. decades late I would say. But to catch up, we definitely need tournaments here. So that's right. where the effort has to be. In, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, talking about your performance only at 24, uh, till then, you continue to believe that you could make it to the top 100 at that point of time? Uh, yes, in a way I did. But honestly, when I look back now, I realize that I did not know what it took to be in the top 100 at that time. I believed I did, luckily. Uh, but I was quite, I was further away than I thought. But uh, the fact that I thought it was close, I, yes, I did believe. I thought uh, that I had a big game and that if I use my skills well, I would be able to break through. And uh, yeah, and uh, and I kept persevering. It was not easy, but I'm also going to be honest and say that I had, uh, uh, you know, a lot of factors going for me in the sense that financially I was 
uh, supported by my family and I did not have any pressure. Uh, and you know, for most people, that is not uh, a luxury they can afford. So I was able to play for those many years on sit out not playing and still be able to come back and do this. And maybe a lot of people would have had to go do something else in their careers because they would have had to, you know, move on with their lives. So I was one of the lucky ones who was able to, you know, uh, chase my dreams even though I had obstacles in front of me and had many years of waiting. Yeah. So it's it's not just the finance part. The on the parents part, they want to know that, you know, they're doing the right thing for you, that you're choosing to do the right thing, and it's so important for the parents to. You know, feel that whatever you're doing is right. You know, at that point of time, what you're pursuing is right. So, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your parental support in that area? Yeah, I think uh, my parents and my entire family in general has been very supportive of me when it comes to that, when it came to that. Uh, my grandparents put me in the sport to start with. I think I, I'm sure you remember my grandfather used to bring me to the tennis court all the time, and <laughs> yes. uh, you know they always had. Uh, uh, I, for whatever reason, yeah, I he was very upset with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was very <laughs> upset with me at one point of time because uh, we had players in our courts, and then he uh, he felt that I was not giving you enough attention. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my grandfather has uh, made me switch a lot of coaches in uh, Chennai. I remember going to multiple coaches. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So he always had this um, sort of firebrand vision, and he felt that uh, I should become number one in the world and uh, you know win Wimbledon that was his dream and he always used to repeat that and possibly when I was young when he was you know when he always sort of spoke about it and uh, told me those things I automatically believed that I could go up in tennis and uh, obviously when I was injured I was not thinking I'm going to be number one I believed I could be very successful I honestly didn't know how far I could go but one thing I knew was I wanted to uh, find a way to give myself a chance to succeed and see how far I could go. And uh, I remember setting my goal initially saying I want to be 500. And then I got closer to 500. Then I said, okay, I know I'm going to get to 500, so I want to be 300. Then I was like, I want to make it to the Grand Slam qualifying. And from there on, you know, step by step, I started to have these short-term goals while always having the long-term goal in mind that I want to be someone who's playing consistently at the Grand Slam main draws, being someone who can one day be a Grand Slam uh, potential champion. And, you know, for a lot of people that, that would sound crazy, even if I had a 24 or even today if I say it. But I think that at the end of the day, uh, you know, if you don't aim for the stars, you're not going to reach as high as you can. Irrespective of where that ceiling is. Uh, so, I, I'll take a couple of questions. We still have... Uh... Uh, five minutes left, <laughs> so sure, can you sure. take a couple of questions from the uh, attendees? Yes, please. Uh, please. Dear juniors, Prajnesh, well, this is from an anonymous attendee. He doesn't, yesterday also he was anonymous. Dear juniors, Prajnesh was like a typical Indian athlete, skinny and weak. But in the men, <laughs> and now from what we see, he has been, he has grown taller, stronger, fitter. What changes did he make and tips to Indian athletes facing such issues? Well, I think I just um, I'm one of those um, players or people who just uh, matured slower in terms of my body. Um, I, I did, obviously, initially when I was very young, I didn't do all the right things in terms of fitness. But by the time I was 15, I started doing the right things. Uh, but it took a while for me to really, you know, fill out. And I was obviously growing taller as well. And between 15 to 20, 15 to 20, I was still growing. I was still gaining height and you know, no matter how much fitness I tried to do or how much weights I did, I just didn't get much bigger. And you know, tennis is an endurance sport, so it's not easy to really put on that much muscle that fast. So it's it was a little bit of a waiting game and it's just about, you know, saying as long as I'm doing all the right things and uh, uh, checking all those boxes, eventually I will get the required level of fitness. And then it just, it happened over, over a number of years. So, it's consistent hard work which led me to being physically able to compete at a higher level, not just with my tennis. Okay. Now, uh, Kamesh Srinivasan from the Hindu, he wants to know uh, what you feel that you need to do to break into the top 50. You're probably working on it already. So. Right. Uh, 
I I could list out lots of things, but uh, to keep it short, I would say uh, first thing I think I would I have to improve my mental endurance. So this is something that I feel at that level is something that's not very obvious from outside because you always see how well they hit the ball, you see how well the players move, but one of the most important things is how well they compete, how how long they're able to do it for. So at that level, there's no there's no room, and it's a little bit like somebody like me. I mean to maybe play on 6th year rather than 5th year and there isn't a 6th year for me so I'm on overdrive consist on continuously through the match so learning to have that gear uh, or play at that gear more often eventually that becomes an average for you so that is something that I feel is very important for me to do to be able to win and become a top 50 player alongside developing other skills uh, I think for me I have to maximize my serve more I think I have room to improve there. For example, how if you look at Ram Kumar stats on his serve versus my stats, is a far better. But if you look at power, maybe we're serving similar speeds, or very very small difference. So, in my opinion, I'm like if Ram Kumar is serving with that many, if his stats are that he's getting this many aces in a match and this many free points, why am I not doing it? And if I can close that gap, that just gives me a little bit of more of an advantage against the guys I compete with because I have my own weapons as already. and it will be something that I'll be adding on down so the first thing i can think of is the serve and second thing i can think of is improving my transition game so i played a lot of mid court balls and i don't convert those points as much as i should i don't know what the percentage is but i believe that i should be winning a lot more of those points and then that will automatically put pressure on the opponents to play better shots against me knowing that if they don't they're going to lose a majority of the points on the mid court okay So we have another question: How to read the serve? Do you have uh, some tricks or uh, tricks to add to that? Uh, I think uh, reading the serve is uh, something that comes in practice. The more you, the more you return serves um, at whichever level you are talking about, the more you do it, the the more the quicker you react. Uh, there are some cues like uh, doing the split step on time and watching the ball very carefully. uh some players have a tell on the serve where you know with a different off they have a different spot that they're going to serve but the higher up you go the less of a tell there is so it really comes down to pure reaction and uh honing those reaction skills which comes when you when you keep practicing the return and maybe for example in practice not saying tell your tell your partner to serve in one spot and you return that instead you say serve wherever you want and you keep trying to catch the return uh keep guessing and trying to catch the return and eventually you get better at it okay so we take one last question and then uh, we'll be running out of time uh, dr j manley most indian players succeed only after age 25 or more can prajnesh now with hindsight advise younger players how to achieve success quicker uh, i think um, that's it's i i wouldn't really say that the big part of that is because of the players as as such it's is just that it's difficult for us we have a lot of obstacles in tennis in india we are not a tennis playing nation like how we are uh, we are not a tennis superpower we for example in cricket i'm sure it would not be like that the average age of success wouldn't be the same and i think for it to be this uh, for it to become earlier in tennis i think we need to have better systems better to- more tournaments more players competing and the depth will improve and automatically the players will succeed at a younger age so i think it's just a matter of doing the right things at the ground level and then you will see the improvements over a period of time very good uh, prajnesh it was excellent giving us all these insights as always like you guys you players who are making it to the top you have so much of clarity of thought and you're able to communicate so clearly and so well and thank you for sharing all those tactics and you know things which is which is going to be the subject of today's uh, presentation uh, it is kind of a prelude to that presentation okay and any time okay. uh, thank you for having me thanks, and uh, uh thanks sir all right take care thanks everybody for watching bye bye you too and then i are you going to go back to sleep now or uh, <laughs> do you <you're, laughs> i'm awake for now but maybe i'll take a midday nap <laughs> <laughs> okay. right. bye bye, bye. 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 bye.